Okay, ladies and gentlemen, it's very nice to be here and very nice to see you all there listening to what I'm going to say. And you don't have to be afraid. I'm not definitely going to sing here. I'm I'm going to restrict myself to speaking only, which is a nice thing for you. Let me tell you that. Uh, and I will have to rely on my notes for three reasons here. First, one of them is that I'm going to give you a history lecture. There are so many years, so many dates, so many countries, so many names that I simply cannot hold them in my memory, even for the 15 or 18 minutes that I'm going to speak. And then, secondly, some of the things that I will be telling you will be uh, at least quite complicated. And some of you might even find them morally offending. That is not my purpose in any way. So bear with me there. And thirdly, you know how university professors are. They simply just love hearing their own voice. So if I wouldn't have my notes with me, this would never end. <laughs> okay. God cannot alter the past, but historians can, said the 19th century Victorian writer Samuel Butler once. And to ensure yourself that this particular statement is true, you only have to take a look at some history book that was published 30 years ago and compare that to a book that has been authored by modern writers. Sometimes it's very hard to, to believe that they are actually writing about the same things because the interpretations can be so different. And as the saying goes, every generation uh, writes its, its own history. Changing history can be fun and rewarding. Politicians do it all the time, as you know. If you do it well enough, you can even get a career out of it. Trust me, as a professional historian, I know what I'm talking about here from my own experience. But it's not only the historians, professional historians, that are toying around with past interpretations of past. For example, here in Finland, on any given Friday night in almost any given corner pub, you can come across a group of, of uh, slightly intoxicated men who are eagerly debating about various what-if scenarios of history. Most often they have to do with Second World War, being in Finland, but there are some other favorite topics as well. For example, would the Third World War have broken out in October 1962 as a result of Cuban Missile Crisis if the President John F. Kennedy had not been so unyielding towards the Soviets? Or in Finland, would Finns have a better national self-esteem if it hadn't taken us 50 years to win the Euro Eurovision Sun Contest. These kind of what-if scenarios, also known as counterfactual history in professional language of historians, are a favorite pastime of all history enthusiasts. How would the events have folded out if the choices had been different? Would things have turned out for the better or for the worse? Historical, historical speculations stimulate our imagination and they can be very, very entertaining. And if you do it meticulously enough, you can even learn something. You can improve your historical understanding. Counterfactual considerations shed light on past decision-making situations and the range of choice that was available for those people who in the past were facing these situations. Uh, in my academic career, I have been part of two different academic history projects that have had to do with alternate history, these what-if scenarios. And today, with you here, uh, I'm going to continue on this path with a scenario that I have never tried before. And with a scenario that some of you might find a little bit questionable. I came up with this scenario when I, when I was reading a book by American Dr. Jeffrey S. Kurok, and I want to acknowledge my debt to him before I start my experiment here. The title of, of Kurok's book was shocking indeed. The Holocaust Averted, the Alternate History of American Jewry, 1938-1969. As the title of the book tells us, Kurok 
is speculating in his book how the life of Jews in the United States would have turned out if Hitler and his Nazis would not have killed six million Jews during the Second World War. As Kirok mostly is writing about events that happened in the United States or North America, I decided to use his help and use his starting scenario to apply that to European events. But before I start, one must ask, are there some historical events that are simply too grievous and too negative, too dark to speculate upon? Or some counterfactual considerations or perspectives that are simply too objection objectionable to take? What if the Germans hadn't killed six million Jews in the Second World War? Really? The immense, immense dismal consequences of the Holocaust are obvious, of course. But is it distasteful in this context to consider that even some good might have come out of this ultimate evil? And to put it, it in a little bit more radical fashion, what would have been the negative historical repercussions and consequences if the Holocaust had not taken place? This is my task here for the next couple of minutes now. I believe it is peace for our time, said British Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain famously after the Munich Agreement in September 1938. In the pages of world history, this ingiving attitude towards Hitler's aggressive demands and Hitler's aggressive foreign policy has become known as appeasement. And it has long been considered to be one of the biggest mistakes in the history of diplomacy. As a result of this agreement, Hitler reached his goals of buying more time for rearmament of Germany. And in autumn 19, uh, still in 1938, autumn 1938, German army was very weak and would have very probably been defeated by the troops, Czechoslovakian troops. Czechoslovakia was a highly industrialized country at the time, uh, at least if Czechoslovakia would have received proper military and political support from the Western powers. But as we know here, this didn't happen. And in September 1939, when Hitler finally attacked Poland and started the Second World War, Germany had developed a frightening military capacity in just a very brief, brief time, only a year's time. So it is at this point of our story that I divert from the actual historical reality. Instead of giving in to the German Führer, in my scenario here, Chamberlain pounded his fist on the table of the mansion in Munich. Kaboom! Shouting, no way in hell we're going to sell out our Czechoslovakian allies to this crazy Hitler. And in his unwavering stance, he received eager support also from the French Prime Minister, Edward Daladier. Italian leader Benito Mussolini, who was also present, was wise enough to shut up and adapt to the situation. Hitler, of course, was furious because of that, shouting red face, this means war. And of course, knowing Hitler, war it meant. But the events did not go at all as Hitler had planned them to go. With the help of strongly fortified defense lines and good supplies of both war material uh, and troops from Great Britain and France, strong Czechoslovakian army was quickly able to halt the advance of German troops and actually force them to retreat back towards Germany. As Sudetenland were quickly recovered and Czechoslovak, British, French uh, combined troops reached uh, German soil in Dresden, Chemnitz and Breslau, German population obviously was in panic and in great anger towards the war crazy leadership. German military, who had been very reluctant to take this foolhardy adventure in the first place, uh, decided to withdraw their loyalties from Hitler at this point. In Berlin, the German National People's Party and other conservative forces whose fifthly sized the physical centers of power like radio and television stations supported them. The Führer, Adolf Hitler, was imprisoned and Nazi party outlawed by a special emergency decree. And then, as it happened in November 1938, the Nazi reign that had began in January 1933 was over for good, and Europe let out, of course, a sigh of relief, getting rid of a person like Adolf Hitler. 
There was a second peace treaty of Versailles only less than 20 years ago after the first one. And in this uh, peace treaty, Germany pledged to downsize its army, to pay war reparations to Czechoslovakia, and to cancel the anti-Semitistic anti Nuremberg laws. And as a result of this, of course, it became easier for the Jewish population to live in Germany. But it didn't root out the centuries-old traditions of German anti-Semitism. Merely these traditions were, for the political necessity of things, shrugged under the carpet. Central Europe in general at those days was not a particularly happy place for millions strong European Jewish population. They continued to be discriminated against, even after Hitler, that is, isolated and targeted with all kinds of racist acts of hatred. Uh, not only in Germany, but also in Austria, Poland, Romania and Hungary. In Germany, conservatives at this point held the power and they cursed Hitler for having blown this world historical opportunity of establishing German domination over whole Europe, or at least considerable parts of Europe, because of his rushing. Nazi leaders, Hitler's hasty mistake, might even prove to be life-threatening for Europeans. As it was quickly found out, the communist Soviet Union was quickly building up its military capacity and planning to extend its sphere of influence over Finland, over the Baltic countries, eastern Poland and northeastern Romania, now when Germany was not in the way anymore. And German conservative leaders were right. In 1942, Soviet dictator Josef Stalin made his move and attacked what was left of Poland. However, in a similar fashion as Hitler before, also the Soviet leadership had underestimated both the military capacity of Central European powers and their willingness to work together to counter the communist aggression. This was helped in those historical situations or realities by the fact that staunchly conservative nationalist and fiercely anti-communist forces were leading most of the countries in Europe. Charles de Gaulle in France, Franz von Papen in Germany, Winston Churchill in Great Britain, Ion Antonescu in Romania, Miklos Horthy in Hungary, Josef Pilsudski in Poland and Edward Penes in Czechoslovakia. This great European anti-Bolshevik alliance of seven countries was able to find a common goal and joined forces to strike down the communist giant. Soviet Union was pushed back to the east, and Ukraine, Finland and Baltic countries regained their independence. This harmony within the alliance didn't last for too long, however, as the great alliance quickly became dissolved because of a host of internal disagreements. France and Germany were already quarreling about the fate of Rhineland. The Brits wanted to detach themselves completely from the continental quarrels, Romania and Hungary returned to their historical uh, and traditional mutual hostility. Poles and Czechoslovakians on their part were suspicious of everybody around them, especially Germany, who again, once more in its history at this point in time, was in the process of intensive and aggressive military buildup. Okay, when we compare this scenario with actual historical reality, we get a very different picture. There would be no state of Israel, no common memory of the tragedy to create and bond together a strong global community of Jews, and no strategic alliance between Israel and the United States in the Middle East because of, uh, of the fact that Holocaust didn't take place whole Middle East, of course, would look completely different compared to what actually happened. And in the absence of this racist crime of Holocaust, racist crime of unprecedented proportions, anti-Semitism would not have lost its appeal and acceptability, acceptability nowhere near the extent that it, that it actually has today in the real world. Holocaust and the Second World War were at the same time most mindless and most futile events in European history, but also indisp indispensable experiences for the future. Because, I claim here, without them, it would have been more or less business as usual for most European powers in the latter half of the 20th century. The states would have still been keen to use violence, 
and warfare as a continuation of politics, and the paramount considerations of European great powers would have revolved around ethnic nationalism, power politics, and territorial expansion. Eventually, all of this would have boiled over to a third large-scale military confrontation on European soil only within just a few de decades, the Third World War, that is. To visit our alternate historical scenario for the last time, let us go to year 1951. In the real life, this was the year of the establishment of European coal and steel union between Belgium, France, West Germany, Italy, Netherlands and Luxembourg. Founding of this multinational organization signaled an irreversible and decisive break with Europe's belligerent history. In later decades, peaceful cooperation and integration of Europe would lead from this organization to the establishment of European Union. Union's motto, as we know, is unity in diversity. Europe needed both the Holocaust and the Second World War to understand the greatness and splendor of this thought. In our alternate scenario, Germany created a worldwide sens sensation in 1951, April, by announcing publicly that its nuclear weapons program had reached a successful culmination and that the country was about to start a series of nuclear tests in its African colonies. A couple of weeks after that, National Socialists made a spectacular comeback to politics in parliamentary elections by taking 20% of the total vote. And with this thought, ladies and gentlemen, I leave once and for all our alternate reality. We learn from history that we learn nothing from history. Irish playwright George Bernard Shaw once snapped, obviously in frustration with the general incompetence of human race. And if one looks at the first half of the 20th century, it's very difficult to agree against him. But with our counterfactual exercise today, I would protest this view in the light of events of the latter half of that same century. I dare to say that Europe learned some kind of lesson of the horrors of the Second World War. It is unpleasant, but at the same time truthful to conclude that herein lies the positive value of the Holocaust. With the exception of 1919 wars in Yugoslavia uh, and Srebrenica, there has been no military confrontation on European so uh, soil or uh, no re-entering of genocidal politics uh, to European realities. Simultaneously, as one acknowledges the tremendous historical significance of this development, one is simply stunned and breathtaking by the human price of this achievement. One of the most important lessons from the first half of the 20th century is, in my opinion, that you should never, never underestimate the lengths to which collective human ignorance and stupidity can take us. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, to end on a more positive note and to tie my presentation to the general future-oriented positive spirit of our seminar, I end with this remark and this thought. Imagine if, imagine if the lesson taught to us by the Holocaust finally would be the one that the humanity has learned and taken to heart for good. Thank you.